month. Um, uh, Professor Wilkinson got her PhD in Berkeley, and she is the recipient of two many numerous prizes, including the Satter Prize, the Conan Prize. She is a fellow of the AMS, uh, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Academia Europea, and she was an invited speaker at the ICM in 2010 in Hyderabad. Um, it's our pleasure and honor to have Professor Wilkinson give this talk, please. Thank you so much. Is it? It's my pleasure um, to have been invited and to give this talk. So, what I'm going to tell you about today is um, a subject that has been fascinating me for a little while now, um, and the title says it: "It's asymmetry and dynamics." So, uh, I'm going to tell you <laughs> what asymmetry and dynamics means. Um, Let's start with asymmetry. And in fact, let's start with symmetry. So what is symmetry? Symmetry uh, is uh, a notion that we uh, typically apply to objects. And what we mean when we say a symmetry of an object is a motion of the object that leaves the object unchanged. And so to give an example, um, a beautiful, symmetric object in real life is a snowflake. Um, and an idealized snowflake uh, has a bunch of symmetries, um, 12 to be exact. So um, of course you can leave the snowflake alone, don't do anything to it, that's a symmetry. Or you could rotate it by two pi over six or um, 60 degrees. And you see the idealized snowflake remains unchanged. Um, and you could rotate it any multiple of 60 degrees. And then there's one other symmetry, which involves taking the snowflake out of the plane and flipping it over. And you could flip it over once, and that's a symmetry, or twice, and then you're back to where you started. So these symmetries, these motions, form a group. Um, that's not really surprising because the, the notion of group comes from symmetries. I mean, a group is a natural generalization of a collection of symmetries. Um, and in this case, the, the snowflake group is also known as the dihedral group D6. And it's generated by, um, has two generators, A and B, where uh, A is this rotation by 60 degrees, and B is the flip I showed you, which has order two. Okay, so now what is what do I mean by a dynamical symmetry? Again, what do I mean by a dynamical system? So for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to restrict myself to a discussion of smooth dynamical systems. Now, a smooth dynamical system uh, is an evolution of a space, a smooth space or a manifold over time. Um, the simplest such a system to describe, which I'll describe first, is when the evolution occurs over discrete time. Um, and so to get a smooth dynamical system, all we actually need is a manifold M and a CR map from M to itself, R times continuously differentiable. And once we are given such an object, we can view um, this as generating an evolution of M over time. If you want, you can think of M physically as a state space. And so if we start with the point X and M and we apply F, we get another point F of X, which again is in M and that's key um, because then we can apply F again and we get um, F of F of X, which we call F, F square of X and which we, uh, view as the position of X under two units of time and so on. So we can do this forward as many times as we like. And this evolution, which is um, also dictated by just application of the K-fold self-composition of F, this evolution where we let K vary over the natural numbers 
um, gives what we call the orbit of X. And the orbit is the fundamental object orbit. So the fundamental object of study in dynamical systems. Now, if F ha happens to be invertible, then we can also take a pre-image and we can talk about the position of X F minus two of X, which is F inverse composed with itself twice. We can also talk about the past. And so if it's invertible, the full orbit of a point X is actually the, the application of all forward and backward iterates of F to the point X. Okay. So what is the symmetry of a dynamical system? So a symmetry is going to be, well, it should be a map from M to M that kind of preserves the class of CR maps from M to M and preserves invertibility if F is invertible. Um, so we define a symmetry to be a diffeomorphism. So not just a smooth map, but a smooth map with a smooth inverse. Um, and the condition for a symmetry is that this diffeomorphism commute with F. And I'll explain why this is a good notion of symmetry um, in, in a few slides. Um, so another way of writing F being, or H being a symmetry of F is to say that H conjugates F to itself. Or if you like, you can think of H as a smooth change of coordinates. And under this smooth change of coordinates, F is preserved. A smooth change of coordinates preserving F. And please stop me if you have any questions. Okay. So like symmetries of objects, symmetries of dynamical systems also form a group under composition. Okay, so the identity map, H being the identity map certainly commutes with F. Um, and if I take the inverse of the symmetry under composition, it's also a symmetry. And you can see that H composed with F is F composed with H. If I multiply or I compose on both sides by H inverse, you see that H inverse also commutes with F. Um, and similarly, if I have G and H commuting with F, then their composition commutes with F. So it's an easy exercise. So let's give a name to this group. It's, um, it's called S of F. Um, and that's a subgroup of the group of diffeomorphisms, the CR diffeomorphisms of M under composition, which is itself a group. Um, now this space, and this is gonna come up later in the talk, we like to view this space as kind of the space of all potential symmetries of a dynamical system F. The important thing about this space is that it's a topological group under composition. So there's a topology on the space of CR diffeomorphisms. Two CR diffeomorphisms are close. If for every point, the image of that point is close and the derivatives of the, of, of, of the two maps are close uh, and so on up to order R. So that describes the CR topology. So this is a topological group. And in fact, it's a complete metric space. Uh, you can metrize this topology and you'll get a complete metric space. Okay, so now consider the case and I'm gonna talk about both cases, but consider the case where F itself is a diffeomorphism. So in other words, it's an invertible dynamical system. It has a past, every orbit has both a past and a future. So in that case, um, if I take any iterate of F, then it'll also be a symmetry of F, right? F to the N composed with F is F to the N plus one, which is F composed with F to the N. And this is true for any N in Z. And so in fact, this group generated by F is a subgroup of the group of symmetries in that case. And in fact, it's a normal subgroup you can check. So 
any diffeomorphism always has trivial symmetries. We call these trivial because they just come for the dynamics itself. Okay. So those are some preliminaries. And now I said I would justify why I call these symmetries, call this a symmetry of the dynamical system. Well, there's already been some kind of justification, but let me justify further. So I said that the orbit is a fundamental object of study in dynamics. It's the evolution of the state over time. Okay, and so just pictorially, um, if I take a point X and I look at its image under F, and I look at the image of that under H. And on the other hand, I look at its image of X under H and I apply F, the commutativity, the commutativity implies, well, that this picture commutes. And so F takes H of X to F of H of X. So if we iterate this picture, we see the picture, the following picture. So here I'm just looking at the orbit of X again and reminding you what I mean by F squared of X. Okay, so we look at X and we let it evolve over time. We could also let it evolve if F were invertible, we could evolve backwards in time. And the picture that I just showed you now can be iterated to tell you that H just takes one orbit to, it takes orbits to orbits, okay? So symmetry preserves the fundamental object of study in dynamics. Okay, well, symmetries preserve a lot of things about dynamical systems and even, uh, and even smooth invariants because we're looking at these smooth symmetries. So the simplest, kind of example would be periodic orbits. So we've already shown that orbits map to orbits. If we define um, fix of F just to be the set of all points in M that are fixed by F, then a simple exercise, which I'll try to do, um, tells us that if X is a fixed point, then H of X is also a fixed point because if I take H of X and I apply F to that, that's the same as H of F of X because these two commute and that's H of X. So this is also a fixed point. And so the set of all points that are fixed by a dynamical system have to be um, the set, not the individual fixed points. The set has to be preserved by any symmetry. And the same is true if we iterate, and these are the so-called periodic points. These are points that come out, uh, come back after at most k iterates, um, or after k iterates. Um, and so the same, the same argument works there. So that's a very simple case. Now you <coughs> could, if you have a periodic orbit, you can associate to it a multiplier. Uh, which is the derivative of, so suppose, for example, X is just a fixed point. If we look at the derivative of F at X, that's a linear map from the tangent space at X to itself. And um, if H is a symmetry, then the derivative of H at that periodic point also will commute with the derivative of F. Okay, so these are multipliers and we can do this for periodic points as well. And if you know more about higher dynamical invariants, things like stable manifolds, which are associated to hyperbolic fixed points, these are also preserved by symmetries. Um, and if you know something about ergodic theory, I won't say any more than just these words, the set of invariant measures, invariant probability measures for a dynamical system are also preserved. That set is also preserved by any dynamical symmetry. And kind of generalizing periodic points, one can look at points that are sometimes called nostalgic points of a dynamical system. These are points that revisit a neighborhood, well, roughly. 
revisit a neighborhood of themselves uh, infinitely many times. Or maybe a better way of describing is these are points that don't wander. Okay. So these are non wandering sets. Um, and I can, um, if I can give you a definition non wandering set of F is just the set of all X such that for every open set containing X, there exists an integer N greater than or equal to one such that F to the N of U intersect U is non empty. So this is the complement of the set of points where there's some neighborhood that just wanders off and never returns to itself. So this is not hard to see since its complement is open, it's not hard to see that this is a closed subset of M. And um, it's an invariant subset. And it's where I like to say, it's where the interesting dynamics occur. And again, as a little exercise, you can see that, um, oops, there we go. As an exercise, you can see that if X is not wandering, non wandering set for F, then, and H is a symmetry, then H of X is also a non wandering point for F. And um, so H preserves the non wandering set. Uh, so does H inverse. So in fact, H does preserve the non wandering set. Uh, and this is for any H in the symmetry group of F. Now, in the case of complex dynamics, you can draw pretty pictures to illustrate this. So this is part of the reason why I wanted to describe this. So in the case where F is a polynomial, so you can assume it has a map from the complex plane to itself, or if you like, you can compactify and think of it as a map from the Riemann sphere to itself. Or let's just think of it from the complex plane to itself. Then the non-wandering set of F has a name. It's called the Julia set of F. So these are the set of points in the complex plane that neither, um, that neither converge to a fixed point in the interior, well, that neither converge to a periodic point nor go to infinity. So these are points that kind of stick around. So for example, if I take, if I take a trivial example, F of Z equals Z, then the Julia set is the entire complex plane. If I take an example, F of Z equals Z to the K, then it's not hard to see the Julia set is a circle because any point inside the circle maps to the origin under future iteration and any point outside the circle maps to infinity under iteration. Whereas any point on the circle will eventually return. Any neighborhood will eventually return. So here the Julia set is a circle. And as another exercise, if I took say f of z equals z squared minus two, then the Julia set of f is an interval. So exercise to fill in the details there. Okay, so now I can give some pretty pictures to illustrate what I mean by uh, the statement that the, sym the symmetries of a dynamical system preserve the non-wandering set. So let's consider this polynomial. Um, so it um, has leading term c to the ninth and consider the map, the complex plane to itself and consider the, the map h of z equals zeta z where zeta is an eighth root of unity. So this is just, h is just a rotation by two pi over eight. That's, that's our h. I claim this is the symmetry of F. So let's just work out the computation. It's pretty simple. So F of H of Z is F of Zeta Z. And if I plug that into the polynomial, I get this. And now using the fact that Zeta to the ninth equals Zeta, I get this, this is just Zeta here. And then I can pull out the Zeta. And now notice this is Zeta 
times f of z, and this is h of f of z. And the group, so the symmetry group of f is going to contain the group generated by h, which is, as again, I said again, is a group um, of order eight, a cyclic group of rotations. And so we should see that symmetry in the Julia set. And here is the Julia set uh, for this particular polynomial. And notice it does have this two pi over eight symmetry. So please stop me if you have any questions. Here's another polynomial. <clears throat> and as before, um, this is going to have a symmetry of order six. And that's because same calculation as before, all right? But there's an additional symmetry. What is it? Well, if you notice, the coefficients of this polynomial are real. And so that means if I take f of z bar, this is f of z bar, because it has real coefficients. And so that means g of z equals z bar is also a symmetry. Therefore, the symmetry group of this polynomial contains the group generated by h and g, which is the snowflake group. And so as we would hope, or we would imagine that this uh, Julia set would look like a snowflake of some form. And yes, it does, in fact. OK, so those are some fun illustrations. I want to say just a little bit more about um, symmetries in general. So I talked about how a, a continuous time dynamical system is generated by a single diffeomorphism of a manifold. Now suppose instead I wanted to um, have dynamics that evolve continuously in time. So I still have a manifold, but now time is not the integers or the natural numbers. Is there any necessary, I have a question here, condition for a set to be a Julia set of a dynamical system? Uh, yes, um, if, you, if you're talking about, um, uh, if you're talking about, uh, um, uh, complex dynamical polynomials or rational maps. Um, yeah, well, they certainly have to have a conformal group of symmetries. Um, uh, and there are probably additional properties that, uh, that are required, um, certainly. But I don't have a complete answer to that question. I have a partial answer, okay. So now I want to talk about continuous di time smooth dynamical systems, not conformal ones. So notice the ones we did before were non-invertible. And non-invertible maps actually have some extra symmetries as well as well in the complex, don't you know, in the complex um, dynamics, um, you get extra symmetries from being non-invertible. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that. Okay, so a smooth flow. So smooth flow is how we model a continuous time dynamical system. And what is it? Well, it's a smooth map um, from, so R is going to be a time parameter and M is the spatial parameter. And so phi T of T comma X, we denote by phi sub T of X. And we think of this as the position of X after T units of time. And it has the property, so to, to, co to correspond to the kind of time invariance of the rules generating a discrete time dynamical system, we require that a flow has the following two properties. The first is that if I flow for time S and then for time T, that's the same as flowing for time T plus S. And the second is that if if I flow for time zero, it just gets the identity diffeomorphism or identity map. Okay, so if I have a flow, I can fix the unit of time and then just consider the iterates um, during those period, the, during the multiples of that time period. And if we pick, say, the time to be one, then we call it the time one map of phi, phi sub one would be the time one map. Now that map is smooth, but it's in fact a diffeomorphism. 
so it has a smooth inverse. That's an exercise. It just follows from these properties. Okay. So in fact, I get a diffeomorphism from any flow. And um, as I said, we call it phi sub one. And this is consistent. These two different notions of time uh, iteration are consistent. So because of these laws that I imposed up here, these rules, if I take the time one map and I iterate it n times, that's the time n map from the flow. Okay. So any continuous time dynamical system has contains inside of it discrete time dynamical systems. Well, what about the other direction? So suppose I have a discrete time dynamical system. So given F, does there exist a flow such that F is the time one map of the flow? Okay, so that's a question. Well, so there is an obvious obstruction for a diffeomorphism to embed in the flow, and that's a topological one. So if you embed in a flow, then the flow itself gives a homotopy between that map, the time one map, and the identity. So if F is not homotopic to the identity, it doesn't embed in a discrete time. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, it doesn't embed as the time one map of a flow. But we could refine this question, and now it becomes an interesting question. Which diffeomorphism is homotopic to the identity embedded in smooth flows? So I'll return to this question later. Saying a little bit more about flows, um, a smooth flow is generated by a vector field. And the vector field is just obtained by differentiating the time t map of the flow and setting t equals zero. Um, so what this means in this definition of V means that if I take an orbit of the flow, which I didn't exactly define, but the orbit of the flow of, of the point X under the flow, I just take any possible time and I apply it to X and I get a smooth curve or maybe I get a fixed point depending on whether, um, whether um, this, this point is fixed or not, right? And if I differentiate this point, or I did, sorry, differentiate this curve at X, that is in, indeed V of X. And so the way in which uh, we can think of as a vector field corresponding to a flow is that here's our vector field on our manifold and the orbits of the flow are just everywhere tangent to the vector field. And given such a vector field, we can asterisk usually generate a flow as well. So if you like, conversely, if I have a smooth system of autonomous ordinary differential equations. So um, I want smooth, a, a kind of uniform uniformity if M is not compact. Um, I can also reconstruct a flow. And that's just the fundamental theorem of existence uh, and uniqueness of solutions to ordinary differential equations. Okay, so if I have a differential equation that, that looks like this, it gives rise to a flow satisfying this. Okay, so what is the symmetry of a flow? A symmetry of a flow is another flow that commutes with the original flow in the sense that for all time, these two, uh, these two compositions are equal. So for, for diffeomorphisms, uh, to look at symmetries, you only have to consider a single iterate of both because that generates the dynamics, but here we have to look at all iterates. So in particular, just some more comments here, a, a flow is a symmetry of itself. Okay. And if a flow is a symmetry of another flow, then that flow, 
is contained in the symmetry group of the time one map. So um, this over here, if you think of this as a subgroup of the group of diffeomorphisms, unless the flow is trivial, uh, this is an uncountable, um, well, no, it, it, it could have finite order. No, but it can't, it's uncountable, sorry, because um, you know, there's gonna be some point that's moved. And so the symmetry group of the time one map of a flow um, um, is going to contain any flow that commutes with it. In particular, the symmetry group of the time one map of the flow is always going to contain um, the flow itself. And so as long as the flow is not trivial, that's an uncountable subgroup. And so the, the takeaway, and this gets back to our earlier question, is that if I take, if I have a diffeomorphism that is the time one map of a flow, it's going to have a lot more symmetry than just a diffeomorphism that isn't the time one map of a flow. Okay, so the theme of this talk is that symmetries are special. That's why asymmetry is in the title because asymmetry is, is more what you would expect. So when you have symmetries, they're special. And I'm gonna illustrate this with three sort of different examples. So first is just, I'm just gonna tell you about Notice theorem, which I understand Karen Ullenbeck talked about last time. Um, I'm just gonna give you like a little taste of that. Um, the second is a question um, some might say a conjecture, but a question posed by Steve Smale. Um, the question was um, whether the typical dynamical system uh, has extra symmetry. So I'll say more. And then finally, I'll just say a few words about some current research that I've uh, been undertaking um, with a couple of my collaborators. Um, uh, about a phenomenon that I call symmetry rigidity. And that says essentially that if you have some extra, enough, enough extra symmetry, then you have a lot of symmetry, at least in some settings. So let's start with Nertus theorem. Okay, so stated in words, the symmetries of a physical system correspond to conserved quantities and vice versa. Um, so this is maybe the simplest formulation. And then an example is, a nice example is the example, oops, my sliding chair, it's a little away from me, of a spinning top. Okay, so imagine you have a top that spins in a frictionless way. And um, I've shown here three different like initial starting points for this spinning top with everything else being the same. Okay, so um, if I start this top spinning with a certain momentum, um, a certain speed, if you like, and a certain angle, um, where it will go under time should be the same as if I rotate the entire picture and then start within this frame, start spinning this, the top with the same initial conditions, let it spin, and then I can rotate it back and I should get the same thing. So what I'm describing here, and same for this, this top. So what I'm describing for you is a symmetry of the dynamical system that generates the spinning of this top. The symmetry is just a rotation around this vertical axis. Okay, it doesn't change. Um, it doesn't change the dynamics of the spinning top. So what Nertes theorem says is that this rotational symmetry around the axis corresponds to the conservation of a physical quantity that you can measure just given the position and velocity of the top. In this case, the angular momentum. They called the angular momentum. Okay, so. Um, now to actually state it formally, um, I'm gonna 
do this via a discussion of Hamiltonian dynamics. So what do I mean by a Hamiltonian? Well, it's just a function on R2n. You can also do this on symplectic manifolds, but this is the simplest formulation. So it's a function on R2n. Um, and the value of h, and it's a smooth function, at least c2, OK? The value of h uh, represents the total energy of a physical system in Ra. And um, the qi's, so this is always confusing, q goes before p in this Hamiltonian world. So q are the position coordinates of, say, a collection of, of particles. And the pi are momentum coordinates. So in the case of the spinning top, you, you would put these, well, I'm not going to give that example. I'll give a much easier example. OK, so, um, so total energy is just kinetic plus potential energy. So here's a very simple example. This is an example when n equals 1. So this is a kind of a one-dimensional physical world um, in which we take a spring. Why am I drawing it this way? Let's draw it this way. Where we mm -hmm. okay. So where we take a spring, and here's the spring at rest, and we put a mass at the end of the spring, um, and we measure the position Q. So here's Q equals zero. We measure the position Q um, of this mass as we pull the string, as, as we pull the mass away from um, this equilibrium. And if we arrange that the spring constant is one and the mass is also one, um, then this will be the Hamiltonian of the system, um, one half Q squared is the potential energy from stretching the spring, and one half P squared, which is just one half MV squared in this case, is the kinetic energy. So it's potential and kinetic. And you can imagine doing this in many other contexts. Okay, so um, now we consider the trajectory of. Um, some some of the particle under some initial condition of, of position and momentum. And the Legendre transform tells us that the print that this trajectory will satisfy the principle of least action if and only if the following ordinary differential equations are satisfied. These are called Hamilton's equations. And these equations it's a first order homogeneous uh, ordinary differential equation. These equations uh, therefore generate a, a, Hamilton, a flow uh, on R2n that we call the Hamiltonian flow. And so the flow, uh, what properties does this flow have? Well, the first is that the flow always conserves this quantity H, the total energy, meaning, meaning exactly this. So if I look along, an orbit of the Hamiltonian flow, the energy stays constant along that orbit. So this Hamiltonian H is constant. Okay. So if I have uh, another function that's constant, um, that's not H, or it could be H, uh, we would call that a conserved quantity of the flow. And let's again return to our example. So in this system, we can write down explicitly what the Hamiltonian vector field is, right? So Hamiltonian, Hamilton's equations give the Hamiltonian vector field, which in this case is the simple vector field here. And we could draw that in the QP plane. This is the QP plane. And we get um, the following, um, uh, vector field, and we can solve uh, this vector field um, exercise that this is the solution. And notice that the uh, condition, let me remove these. The, so the condition uh, that H is preserved um, tells us that this flow 
is tangent to these circles. These circles are the level sets of this Hamiltonian. Okay, so this is consistent with, the, with it being preserved. Um, and here's uh, a picture of um, this, this mass on a spring. Um, it doesn't quite look like a circle because maybe the mass isn't one or the spring constant isn't one. It's in general going to be an ellipse. Um, an exercise for you is why is this going counterclockwise and not clockwise? Um, the answer is that um, you just have to look at the axes. So you've got velocity, which is P, and position, which is Q, and the orientation's been flipped. So that's why it's going the other way. Okay. So Nurta's theorem, proved by Emmy Nurta in 1915, in its simplest form, in the very simplest form, states that if I have two Hamiltonian flows that commute, so you can think of one as being a symmetry of the other, um, and the first flow has Hamiltonian H, say, but the second flow is Ham Hamiltonian P, then the function P is a conserved quantity for phi t. And so, and so you can think of this in the example of the spinning top, um, the, the flow, which is, um, the, so the Hamiltonian um, for the flow, that's the rotation along the axis is uh, angular momentum. And so um, conversely, if I have a conserved quantity, if it's a smooth conserved quantity, it gives you a symmetry of the flow. Okay. And in modern kind of notation and so on, this is very simple to prove and it has to do, you can prove it using a Poisson bracket. And so my takeaway is that symmetries, uh, when you have a Hamiltonian symmetry of a Hamiltonian flow, it's special. It corresponds to a conserved conservation law for the physical system. Okay. Uh, so now um, I'd like to turn to Smale's question, say a little bit about that. So Smale posed the following question as part of his list of questions for the 20th, 21st century, around 2000. And he posed it something like this. Does the typical dynamical uh, diffeomorphism of a closed manifold have only trivial symmetries. Uh, it's certainly what you would expect, right? And you'd think it's an easy thing to prove. I mean, you would expect it because why should a typical dynamical system have any symmetries at all? It should be pretty random behaving, right? So, and then he, he said, well, typical could mean one of many things, but meaning in some sense, large in the space of CR diffeomorphisms of M, where you fix R. Um, so for example, what would be maybe a very weak notion of typical would be to say that there is a dense set of diffeomorphisms that have tri trivial symmetries. So given a diffeomorphism by an arbitrarily small perturbation, you can kill all of its symmetries. And then you can strengthen that condition. So a, a big strengthening of that would be to say that given a diffeomorphism, you can perturb it a little arbitrarily small perturbation, removes all the symmetries, and that's a stable property. Once I've removed them, I can't, if, if I do a small enough further perturbation, it still will have trivial symmetries. Um, that would be an open and dense condition. And then somewhere in between dense and open and dense is a residual or a generic property. So what do I mean by a generic property? Remember the space of CR diffeomorphisms is a topological group and a complete metric space. So it's a, it's a bare space. Um, and so we can talk about residual subsets or sets that are accountable intersection of open and dense sets. So we say a property is generic if there is an intersection, countable intersection of open dense sets such that the property holds, okay? So a generic property, it's a nice, you might wanna think of, um, you know, the, the, the rationals are dense in the real line. The irrationals contain accountable intersection of open dense sets. So they're much bigger, right. okay. So that's what I mean by a generic property. 
Now, Smale student Nancy Capel, before she was doing her important work in applied mathematics, um, actually addressed this question. And in 1970, she proved that if I restrict, if M is a circle, then, um, then the CR typical diffeomorphism, as long as R is at least two, uh, has only trivial symmetries. Okay, so her notion of CR typical is very strong. It's open and dense in the CR topology. Okay. Um, that's actually false for C1. That's not true that there's an open and dense set of diffeomorphisms, C1 diffeomorphisms of the circle with only trivial, uh, that have only trivial symmetries. And so this leaves open, and that's why Smell posed it, um, what about higher dimensions? So there have been some kind of partial results uh, in the C2 topology or CR topology, or at least two, um, for its special classes of dynamical systems for highly chaotic systems. This is also true by work of Palos and Yokos and others. All right, but that, that question is, is in general open, except for the case R equals one. And so this is um, uh, an old, a fairly old, like 15 years old um, result of Christian Bonetti and Sylvain Provisier and myself. So we proved if we take any closed manifold in the C1 topology, C1 generically, uh, a diffeomorphism has only trivial, uh, is, uh, trivial symmetries. Um, so, um, so that's stronger than dense. It's not as strong as open and dense, but it's false for open and dense. It's not true in the C1 topology. Um, and as a side note to this, um, and this proof, by the way, is very special to the C1 topology. It uses some, you know, really uses the C1 topology, not, does not generalize to the C2 topology even. But as a consequence, um, we can answer the previous question. So if I take a C1 generic diffeomorphism, uh, it does not embed in a flow, even if it's homotopic to the identity. Why is this? Well, because you would have a lot more symmetry than just the iterates of F if you embed it in a flow. So that question was actually answered much earlier, this embeddability question um, by Jaco Pallas, I think sometime in the 70s, actually proved this, that you're not embedded you, generically, you don't embed it in a flow. Um, but it is a consequence of this theorem. Um, but for R bigger than one, this is a really wide open question, whether you can do this in general. And in fact, this, this much easier or a priori quite a bit easier question about embeddability is also open for R greater than one as far as I know, which I think is kind of interesting. I don't know if it's quite what you would give to a grad student, but it's an interesting question. Okay, so now I want to turn to symmetry rigidity, which I said is kind of what's um, been, I've been working on recently. Uh, so, um, uh, just like in quotes, symmetry rigidity, it's kind of saying a little bit of extra symmetry implies a lot of symmetry. And let me give you an example of symmetry rigidity that, um, so this is, a theorem of Luo, I hope I got his name spelled right. Um, in fact, let me just check that because I hate miss, um, I hate miss misattributing things. Um, let me tell you what the theorem, okay, so Yu Sheng. So Yusheng Liu, in fact, very recently, like 2018, proved some, proved the following in some consequences. Uh, if I take a, a polynomial in the Julia set has a symmetry of infinite order, 
Okay, so the examples we showed pretty clearly have some finite order symmetries like the snowflake group, the dihedral group, or a cyclic group. But once you have a symmetry of infinite order, uh, then the Julia set is very restricted. And in fact, it can be only one of three things, either the circle, and this would be uh, the dynamics of, of Z goes to Z to the K, an interval, this would be, for example, the dynamics of the map Z goes to Z squared minus two, or the whole plane, and that's just when Z is the identity. So back to the question, which sets can be Julia sets? This gives you even more information. So you're gonna have some conformal symmetries. Actually, you're always gonna have conformal, non-trivial, finite order symmetries. But if you have a single symmetry of infinite order, um, it's very, very, it has to be one of these three examples. And this brings me to my final slide, which is just a very, very loose description of this project with Daniela Damjanovic and Dishang Shu, where we've been studying um, special classes of C infinity diffeomorphisms, what you might call algebraic systems. And so um, more, maybe a little more precisely, we're looking at affine uh, automorph or affine, sorry, affine maps, affine diffeomorphisms of compact homogeneous spaces. And these things can have extra symmetries and often they do. So um, they're highly symmetric. So often um, the ones that we studied, at the very least, these systems that we would study would contain like a, a Z to the K for K bigger than one group of symmetries, but they can also, they can also contain as a subgroup um, T to the K, the torus or R to the K. Okay, so these are the highly symmetric systems. And what we show is for some of these systems, again, this is a caricature, but if I take such a system and I perturb it, you can't have more symmetry. And if you have as much symmetry as the original thing that you perturbed, then in fact, you're in this affine family after a smooth change of coordinates. So, there's no way to perturb outside of this highly symmetric class without, um, without destroying symmetries. And so I say trivial. So for some of these, it does literally mean you start with the system. And if you don't belong to this class of highly symmetric systems up to conjugation by smooth diffeomorphism, then you actually have trivial symmetries again, up to a finite, or you didn't say again, but this is up to finite index, up to finite groups, or finite index subgroups. Um, and so we've, we started this exploration with very simple linear maps of the torus. Um, and that work is published recently in the Duke Math Journal, I think 2022. And now we've moved uh, kind of further into studying um, kind of more complicated systems on nil manifolds, which is what we're working on now. So thank you very much. Um, and it was a pleasure to give this talk. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Maybe let me clap for everybody. Uh, okay. Weird in Zoom land. Um, are there any questions? <clears throat> well, maybe I had a question. Um, yeah. In the story, to what extent does, like, for instance, the positivity of the tangent bundle of the manifold enter the picture? Positive. What do you mean by positivity of the tangent bundle? Like, this is naive. 
Yeah, in algebraic geometry, for instance, we have there are some conjectures, for instance, that like you know, if you look, if you have a you know an algebraic manifold such that you know, if you look at the restrictions of tangent bundle to any say rational curve in there, if it's always mm -hmm. positive, then this should be a homogeneous space. I see. So that's a rigidity for algebraic varieties, right? To do with the action, the positive. Um, so that's telling you something about the manifold as opposed to the a, a, a dynamical system. Right here, like you're not saying anything about the manifold itself. I'm fixing the manifold yeah. in this discussion. Um, but if I knew some more algebraic geometry, I am certain that some of the algebraic systems uh, uh, that are not on homogeneous spaces uh, would be a very, very interesting to study with regard to this kind of um, kind of perturbation of rigidity. So if you want to talk about it, I'd be interested. Sure. Thanks. <clears throat> are there any other questions? Uh, I guess I can but then uh, Amy. Can you tell everybody here for the record that Noether's theorem works only for systems that have Lagrangian formulation, does not work for Navier-Stokes? <laughs> okay. It only works for systems that have a Lagrangian formulation, not, not Navier-Stokes. Yeah, so, yes. you know, if it worked for Navier-Stokes, it would be wonderful because we would discover new conserved quantities and fluid flows we don't see. But then there is, you know, there's no... So basically, I mean, what you're saying maybe is that because you're talking about PDEs versus, and I'm talking about ODEs, um, which I guess in some sense PDEs are like infinite dimensional ODEs, but you can't do this in infinite dimensions. I don't or did I just say I something wrong? Anyway, for PDEs, PDE. it's very different. Yeah, I'm definitely talking about ODEs. Yeah, I mean, you know, the dissipative PDs like Navier Stokes, they live on inertial manifolds of finite dimensions. So, you know, they're pretty much ODE like, even though the manifold is nonlinear. But I just want to say, you know, the other thing that I'm very fascinated in your talk, first of all, thank you for the talk you cover in one hour, eight weeks of my online course plus extra stuff, so it's beautiful. I really enjoyed it. But uh, I want to say that, you know, there's new num numerical work on uh, oil, uh, you know, on uh, non-dissipative uh, fluid dynamics. And there, there are lots of symmetries, tons of symmetries, and there might be some conserved quantities. And I'm kind of very fascinated uh, you know, how to go and find them and what will happen. Uh, cool. that, that's all, oh, I don't know, this is helpful. But you know, this thing about Neville's talks and Merthyr's theorem is a constant. People always bug me, if we have symmetries, why don't we have conserved quantities? That's such a physicist attitude. <laughs> it's like, oh, it? well, just to say, oh, well, of course, symmetries always give you a conserved quantity when it's like, you like why would you necessarily expect that for non-Hamiltonian or Lagrangian you'd be, systems? It'd be beautiful if you got them. Yeah. Keep in mind. <laughs> no, that's really that's that's really interesting. Any other comments or questions? If not, let's thank uh, Amy again. Thank you very much for a beautiful talk. I'll make noise. Thank you. And... <laughs> <laughs> Thanks Good again. Night. It was my pleasure. <laughs> so, goodbye.